talk to you about school feeding, which has been a passion of mine for um, about 10 years now. It started when I was in graduate school, and I was doing research on uh, school meals in the US, as well as physical activities, but focusing on the school-aged child. And uh, when I finished, I, um, or actually when I was still there, I got involved with some work at the World Bank. They were doing um, a book on school health, and they had pulled me in to write a section on non-communicable diseases. So that was sort of my introduction to uh, international work. And already there, I started to see the connections between what I was doing in, for the US and what, what was going on in the rest of the world. Um, after that, I went to work for a company called App Associates. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, it's um, a consulting company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they do a lot of contract work for the government. And there I focused on evaluations of um, programs for um, food assistance, also in the US. And uh, after doing that for a few years, I moved to Europe. And uh, I was at the World Food Program, as Mary mentioned. For, um, and their World Food Program is a, a big player in school feeding, so that was, that was the connection. And um, actually, through my work for the World Bank, I got connected to there. And uh, it was a fascinating experience. I, I loved it. I traveled a lot. And um, as a researcher, it's just very refreshing to do more operational work. At WFP, it's really about getting the food out. It's really about um, getting the money in and designing the food and um, getting it delivered. It wasn't so much about research. Uh, so it was a different kind of, kind of experience for me. And uh, from there, I moved on to Imperial College London, where, which is a key research partner for World Food Program. So I did basically the same kind of work, but more on the research side, um, which was probably a better fit. Um, so basically, I wanted to talk to you and uh, share with you what I've learned through all these different experiences. And on my first slide, I have some logos for different places, the World Bank, WP, and PCD. And really, it's just a compilation of, of, of what I've learned. And um, this talk is a bit different because I want to tell you about school feeding, but also share with you those, those work experiences. So if you have questions um, as I go through, both about the experience as well as the topic, uh, feel free to um, raise your hand, and um, I can tell you some more. Uh, yeah, to start, first of all, I know some of you know something about school feeding, but um, how many of you have heard of this or know about school feeding? Yeah? Yeah? Um, how many of you are from the U.S.? Do you remember getting, uh, did you have meals at school? Yeah? Okay. And um, so school feeding is, first, wait, actually just let me tell you a little overview of my talk. I'm just going to give you a bit, a bit of an overview, global overview, and then I'll tell you a bit about um, the history of school meals. And then I'll finish up with uh, Ghana. I'd like to focus my attention on that. And uh, hopefully it'll build on what you what you learned uh, learned yesterday from uh, Chief Nat's talk. So school feeding, very simple. It's just uh, the provision of food to children through schools. And um, in the international world, we talk about three different types of modalities. There's the meals uh, that can be provided to children in schools. This is uh, the U.S. program. Basically, there's the breakfast and lunch program. Um, there's also uh, snack programs. This can be uh, fortified biscuits um, or milk, fruit, it can be different things, but they don't need cooking. And there's also take-home rations. Take-home rations are um, some sort of commodity or uh, something that's given to children to take home to their families, maybe monthly or every two months. And this can be conditional on them going to school every day. They should be going to school. Um, it could be given only to girls for certain reasons, but um, there's basically three modalities. Uh, you can also combine these modalities, so you can have uh, you can give children meals and then give take-home rations to a subsample of them. And um, there's also all sorts of other factors at play here. What what time of the day you give the school meal? Uh, what what is included in that meal? And who you give it to? Is it primary school? Is it secondary school? Is it preschool? Um, what else is also going on in the school? Do you have nutrition education? Uh, in low and middle income countries, we talk a lot about deworming and uh, malarial. I see a lot of head nodding, so maybe here you've been uh, learning a bit about uh, these other interventions. So, but it's also important to take these also into account for the program. 
And here's just some pictures of what school feeding looks like. Uh, there's, uh, it can be all sorts of different things. So here I have uh, one from the US, one from the US here. And then this little kid, I believe, is in, um, I think he's in Haiti. Here's the one that's from the China program. There is someone here who, where is she? Uh, this is the China program. And then these are biscuits. This here is, um, this is how the food gets delivered through World Food Program. They come through big sacks. And this here is a can of oil, which is a take-home ration, actually. Um, so girls are given a, a big can of uh, fortified oil, cooking oil, to take home to their families in, um, in uh, Afghanistan. And then also to show you on the map where school feeding done. So this is not a very, I don't know if you can see it very well, but basically the point is anywhere that's in green is where school feeding is, is uh, we know school feeding happens. Uh, when I was at WFP, we did a global survey. So we uh, sent out a survey to all countries, from, to the governments, to get information on how many kids are receiving meals, what kind of meals are they getting, how much does it cost, who gets it, all sorts of questions, and so this map kind of displays the, the main results. And overall, we estimate that 368 million children receive meals, and it's about up to 75 billion spent on these programs. And as you can see, most areas are in green. U.S. is in dark green because uh, a lot of children are fed here. Also, Brazil, China has a lot. Um, also, you see in Africa, where most of my work was concentrated, is there's a lot of green. Uh, some countries you don't have, but in the most part, almost every country in the world offers school feeding, which is, which is quite, uh, quite interesting. <clears throat> and then this chart, this is not a very nice picture, but basically what I'm doing here is on the, on the y-axis we're plotting GDP per capita, and on the x-axis is, uh, is year, it's a timeline, and each dot is a country. And so what you'll see is this, um, there's a few dots over here. The UK is here, because it was the first country to start a school feeding program in 1906. Uh, the US is over here, started in 1946. Mm -hmm. And then, this is what's interesting. You see a huge cluster of dots down here, over here, in different colors. And I don't have the country labels, because they don't fit. But you really see a burst of action from really starting from uh, the year 2000. And a lot of these countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So school feeding, uh, there's many different objectives here, which uh, makes it interesting and also makes it a bit complicated. Uh, the one we usually think of in, uh, for developing countries is in education. Uh, school feeding traditionally has been thought of as a means of uh, drawing children to school. Uh, one of the Millennium Development Goals was to increase uh, primary school enrollment, and school feeding was seen as a key intervention to do this. So that's really, when you see that jump after 2000 with countries introducing school feeding, it was for this purpose, to draw children to school, keep them there, and um, increase uh, primary school education levels. And, uh, but it's not just education. Over time, we've come to realize that there's other, other recognized other objectives of the program. Uh, in 2007, 2008, I'm not sure how many of you, of you are aware, but in the international development community, there was, um, it was a, a big issue, which was the food and fuel price crisis. Uh, so prices really escalated, and it was a, it was a global issue. And uh, what we saw, though, however, is that countries were requesting funding from uh, uh, multilateral banks like the World Bank for funding to support their school feeding programs. But even though food prices were going up, they didn't want to cut their programs, they wanted to actually increase it. And the reason for this is they saw it as a means to, to keep households fed. And, um, and uh, so for this reason, we see it as a key social pr protection intervention, actually. Uh, nutrition, that seem, might seem obvious that uh, school feeding is, uh, it has, uh, can have nutritional objectives, but this really hasn't been um, as, rec as fully recognized as it should, I would say, for um, international development. Uh, but uh, this has been increasingly realized. Uh, and there's more research studies coming out on this. Uh, most studies focus on height and weight, so anthropometric status, how, how the children grow. And there's also been quite a few studies uh, on anemia. 
There's a uh, mixed evidence on micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, it's all it's all a bit um, it's all a bit mixed actually. And uh, one area I've been interested in is healthy eating behaviors. Uh, this was always very this was a focus of uh, research in the U.S. So this is where what I had learned about um, that school meals are really not just an opportunity to feed children but to teach them about good nutrition, um, eating together. There's many, there's it's 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 an opportunity to do many things. Um, but in, in low-income countries, this was not, it's not really, um, this is not so much a focus. Uh, in the context of my work, uh, healthy eating can be um, eating uh, local foods. It's also about being, getting exposure to foods uh, you might not get exposed to at home. Um, it's about um, eating well, so. And then the last one, there's also not much research on this, but it's, it's a new one, it's on agriculture. And basically the idea is that school meals can provide a demand for uh, uh, local, uh, local, uh, local producers. And we see this in the US with Farm to School, which maybe some of you have heard of here, yeah? Uh, so um, basically rather than sourcing foods internationally, we can grow it in our own communities and, uh, and feed our children the foods that are grown here. And um, I'll tell you more about this, and this, this will come up in the, in the Ghana example. And uh, all these different factors interrelate, all these different objectives, and you don't need to read this, I just wanted to show you um, a little bit of overview of how these pathways work. Um, we mapped this out for a chapter for the Disease Control Priorities Project, and um, this is a project by the WHO and the World Bank. It'll be coming out next year, and there's a volume on child and adolescent development, and uh, school feeding will be a chapter in there. And then just a little bit on costs and benefits. Uh, costs range uh, depending on many factors, but just on average, what we found through research, that meals cost about $40 per child per year. Uh, biscuits, about half of that. And take-home rations, about $60 per child per year. And these are based on uh, the WP programs. And these are providing children meals every day of the school week uh, for whatever the school year lasts. In uh, Ghana, for example, it'll be 220 days, but in countries, it'll, it'll depend. And then uh, also for that chapter I was telling you about, we estimated some benefit cost ratios, and uh, these are quite stunning. Uh, just looking at education, nutrition, and uh, the learning, the possibility for added productivity later in life, uh, we found benefits of four to one in low-income countries. And then in lower middle-income countries, it was huge, it's like 44 to one. And these are upper bound estimates and it varies by country, but um, these, are the, these are the average uh, impacts we found there. So yeah, I just want to take a quick break because I just threw a lot of information at you. And I just wanted to do a quick little exercise to get you all talking to. Um, <laughs> And what I have here is I'm going to show you some statistics from two countries, Afghanistan and Ghana. And I want you to just think, look, at the, look at the numbers and get a sense of you know, what, what might be an appropriate school feeding intervention for the country, uh, what kind of modality, um, what, other, what, other, what other factors you might consider, what might go into the meal, uh, who might receive it, anything, just to get you all talking, yeah? There's no right answer. And uh, actually, this is this exercise I was doing at WFP to designing programs. If you have a lot more data and you have to do market studies, there's many different things. But <coughs> so uh, you won't have all the information you need here. But here we go. We have Afghanistan and Ghana, and um, <coughs> Afghanistan is a fragile and conflict-afflicted uh, situation country. So you might want to take that into account and to what you think is an appropriate school meal over there. Uh, primary school gross enrollment. Um, I know you're you're always focused in health, not education, but gross has to do with it doesn't matter about um, the age group, so it's just about the total number of children. So, but what you should focus on here is that is the, is a gender disparity. So here you have a huge gender disparity in Afghanistan. Here in Ghana, it's about even. Same thing with attendance. You have a, a gender disparity here. Girls are less likely to attend school than boys. In Ghana, it's less than 100, but it's about even. But attendance seems to be an issue here. And then here I have three nutrition indicators. 
And this is not for the school age population, this is for children who are less than five years of age. But um, we can still use this to inform our, our understanding of what the nutritional status of these children are. So you'll see anemia is a, a major issue in both countries. Stunting is very high in Afghanistan. It's still quite sizable in Ghana, 20%, but um, less so. And underweight, which is uh, low weight for, uh, for age here, is um, also quite high in Afghanistan, and uh, also quite sizable in Ghana. So. so maybe we can start with one country and then go to the <coughs> next, or um, that sound good? Anyone want to give it a stab for Afghanistan? What might be a good kind of a good school meal here? What do you think could um, address these um, issues? Or... And here I'm just focusing on education and nutrition. Remember I told you there's also social protection and agriculture. So if you want to, I didn't include uh, statistics on agriculture here, but um, maybe you have other information or <coughs> other ideas. Anyone? Yeah? Um, I think that there should be a target for girls to help increase school attendance and um, decrease that disparity. And they might want to um, focus on the content of food, um, of increasing iron to try to help with anemia. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Anyone want to add to that? That's a really good. Um... Um, probably with something for them, the girls to take home as well in order to in incentivize going to school for them and something four to five to also decrease undernutrition spending and increase um, iron as well. Great. And also, I think these two go together. That sounds good. Anybody want to add? You can say something different too if you want. There's no right answer, huh? You might want the boys to take home since one of the boys are enrolled. Say that again? I just heard You might want the boys to take food home. Uh -huh. fewer of the girls are in school, so ah, that's, that's an like interesting they idea. More of the girls. Mm. And they might have, uh, there might be girls at home. Right. No, they take home. Yeah. Um, first, off, I apologize. I missed the beginning, so I don't know if this was kind of a correlation that was yeah, made yeah, prior. Right. Um, but does the amount, like, by there being so few girls going to school, do you think that correlates with them having to be home, making sure there's food and things? a good point. I mean, this is what you would do in a more in-depth study is to understand what, what are causing the factors yes. and exactly, and the design of the program should take these into account. Yes. So you're asking the right question. What is keeping them from going to school? And um, in, uh, where WP has a very strong presence is in the Fatah region, yes. which is on the border with Pakistan, okay. and security is a big issue. So okay. But there's also uh, cultural norms. And Definitely. Like okay. But that's a very good question to ask. Anybody else? Yeah, one more over here. <laughs> so I can't see you. Go ahead. Um, okay, so because Afghanistan is a fragile and conflict afflicted situation, where it might be a problem if we allow children to take home food, because then it, food could be almost a commodity in terms of exactly, money. Exactly. Yeah. That can obviously it's yeah. conflict. Yeah. Oh, that's a, okay. So I heard really good points out there. Um, what WFP does there is they have um, fortified biscuits in school uh, because, uh, because of the complex situation you can't really be cooking meals or it's more complicated, the situation is just not stable. So food, uh, these uh, little bars get shipped in and that's what they have and they're fortified with a bunch of different things including uh, iron and then they get a can of oil like I showed you in the picture earlier which is fortified I think with vitamin A and I don't know what but anyway they take this thing of oil home, and this is just for the girls actually. The point about boys is very interesting, and uh, they actually um, they get escorts to take them home, military escorts to take them back for the security reasons. So, yeah, that's, I think it's very interesting. Okay, how about one more example in Ghana, and then I'll tell you more about Ghana afterwards. So. Definitely some iron supplements. Because stunting is a problem among um, like zero to 59 months, uh -huh. I think that the target should be more towards mothers with young children and giving them more food supplements. So um, maybe, I don't know if um, how that would relate to school, but I think that the target should be like more the younger children. 
No, I think it's, that's um, that's always a challenge uh, because um, there's uh, there's community-based programs for specific age groups, but also with the school, the school is a every community has a school. It's nice. So then the child goes there and they can take food home. So maybe one idea could be take home ration that would go for, for mothers and children. Yeah, that was my idea also that we can have take home meals because that, you know it's a safe, safer environment. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Everything else, like the, the numbers look you know, even more yeah. distributed and not too too severe mm -hmm. as in Afghanistan. So there, I think the take home. Yeah, option yeah, yeah. Would be good. Okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I think take home can also be like an incentive for boys and girls to go to school because if they can go to school and then take home food, then that's a win win for both. Uh huh. Sides. Huh? You all like the take-home ration, I see, yeah? <laughs> yeah, when were we there? I actually, I have a question. Um, since you said that they don't really cook in Afghanistan, and I'm assuming they do cook more in the schools in Ghana, with it being such a high anemia rate, would they ever consider just using cast iron pots, just like increase the iron in the food? Oh, that's a nice one. Um, I was, uh, there was a, it's, it's come up with certain companies wanting to sell certain stoves for this, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. I mean, because they're so easy to maintain for long periods of time that you're not replacing their pans as uh -huh. often. Uh-huh. No, you're more thinking, more it's not just about the food. I think oftentimes in this kind of work, we think a lot about the food and we don't think about who's preparing the food and then what they're preparing the food in. And, um, And then I put these indicators just for the under five because I did, did, you don't have estimates for school age children. They're very few in terms of nutrition. So the fact that anemia is high and under five, we can understand that anemia is also high for school age children. So, yeah? so what, one issue I just wanted to point out, all the answers were great, but in, you're mentioning uh, supplements. And uh, I, sometimes in some cases you might want supplements, in some places you might be able to do it through diets. So through the cast iron pots, for example, or um, iron-rich foods. Um, so there can be food-based strategies as well as a supplement. And that's also a choice. That's also a design strategy. Shall we move on? Yeah? I'll tell you more about Ghana when we get to Ghana. So, But before I do that, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, what WP does, because it's a, it's a really a global player in this area. Uh, so I told you before, 368 million children receive uh, a meal a year, and WFP feeds about 25 million of them. So the, the rest of them are generally uh, fed by their government. So it's not just the U.S. which uh, has school meals, but many other countries. Also in Africa, even for the WFP programs, half of the programs, for half of the countries where WFP operates, school feeding, uh, there is a government program going on already. And for many of these countries, the idea is that WFP will scale down and the government will take it over. And then the map shows where WFP is operating. So uh, most of it is in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there's also quite a bit in Asia. Latin America, it's mostly technical assistance. There isn't so much uh, going on there. And then um, also to understand a bit WFP, you have to understand the history a bit. You have to understand the UN a bit. And uh, I thought I'd just share a bit about that because the UN has a lot of different um, bodies in it. And you can basically split them into two groups. One are the specialized agencies, and these are the agencies which uh, get um, part of the funds that member states pay each year to be part of the UN. And then you have these uh, operational agencies. And these ones don't get any core funding. They have to raise all their funding themselves. Uh, so this would be like UN UNICEF, UNHCR, um, WFP is one of them, and WFP has the biggest budget out of all of them, but it raises all that money itself uh, through uh, just regular citizens, through companies, through governments, uh, so fundraising is a, is a huge thing. Um, it was established in 1961, and uh, the U.S. Uh, was basically the one behind it, uh, George McGovern, who uh, supported uh, school meals here in the U.S., was also uh, promoted school feeding abroad as well. And the first program was launched in Togo, right next to Ghana, in 1961. <coughs> and um, there's a program actually named, uh, it's called McGovern Dole, which is the main vehicle for international school feeding from the US. And that was started in 2002, and um, it's, uh, it's very well known all over the world, and it's, it's very well regarded. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is that uh, in 2008, 
Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this food aid discussion, assistance discussion, but um, basically the idea is that um, um, rather than airlifting food from rich countries to poor countries, the idea is more we have to support countries to feed themselves. Uh, so it, rather than calling it food aid, we call it food assistance. So that's also, and that happened about 2008 in WFP. And then I also want to tell you about the linkages with local agriculture. This is an, also an interesting trend. It started in 2003 in Africa with um, basically these nationally sourced school feeding, which is basically uh, sourcing foods from the community rather than sourcing it internationally. Uh, this was included as a, as, as a key intervention from the CADA program. And then they launched these pilots, uh, and NEPAD was uh, running these. Very, and then um, Tope, you might uh, Nigeria was one of the was one of the pilot countries, but it kind of everything kind of fell apart. But it remained in a few countries. Cote d'Ivoire was one, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Mali, Ethiopia. Uh, but many of these programs they couldn't they couldn't really sustain themselves. They started, but there was just a lot of challenges, and uh, they just had a, uh, they kind of fell apart. Um, and here's one of the reasons why it's very complex to design these things, and each country is quite different. It's a very simple concept, I think, uh, but then uh, you have to design the ration appropriately, you have to connect uh, farm, uh, schools with the farms, you have to figure out the pricing, uh, there's many issues. So you don't need to read this chart, but I just wanted to show you basically that um, this is basically what needs to happen to link farms to school. And here is a model in Botswana where everything is fully centralized, the government does everything. And then in Ghana, it's quite decentralized. So you'll find that the caterers in each of the schools has to go out and procure the food and cook it. In Mali, you'll have, it'll be separated out. There's one party who does the procuring and there's one party that prepares the meals. And then Cote d'Ivoire is actually a very nice one where they had these women's groups kind of doing everything. This one is basically falling apart with the, with the civil war there, but um, they're trying to bring it back. <coughs> And then another thing I wanted to mention, which I, I just find interesting through my work, is that uh, is about trying to get support for these programs. And there's support in terms of financing, of course, and also technical support. And financing is quite tricky, because school feeding, as I told you, has these multiple objectives. It's not nutrition, it's not education, it's not agriculture, it's not any, it's not one specific sector. It affects multiple sectors. And uh, this can be tricky, because many of the funding Funding can be very sector specific. Uh, for example, in nutrition, there's a, there's a huge focus in low income countries on the first thousand days. And um, child mortality under five has gone down a lot, but yet this focus really remains on that age group. The school aged child is really gets far less attention. Uh, for the education community, the focus is a lot on education, uh, uh, training, teacher training, school books, infrastructure. Um, but actually, the education sector, I think, has been the most friendly to school feeding in, in, the, in the international world, uh, probably because of the MDGs. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing support from agriculture donors. Uh, and here, the focus is on food security. And uh, traditionally, it's been on commodity crops, so maize and uh, maize, soybean, these kinds of things. But in recent years now, there, there's more support for uh, more dietary diversity and thus crop diversity and other types of crops. This is being led a lot by the Gates Foundation. Um, when I was at Imperial College, that was the funding basically, it was from Gates Foundation to do the work we were doing. And initially the grant was for commodity crops and over time they shifted and said they wanted something else. So, um, and then last of all, there's also health donors. Uh, and here uh, there's more of a focus on the child and adolescent uh, segments of a child's life, not just on the first thousand days. Uh, but here you also see more of a focus on deworming and malaria and food they sort of see as um, someone else's someone else's mandate. So it gets, it gets tricky to piece together um, stakeholders, funding, and so forth across these different groups. Um, it's also important to mention the private sector. Anytime you have uh, food involved, the private sector is very important to consider. Um, a lot of these companies try to get involved to, um, to market uh, their products or um, children are a future market for them. Uh, there's also a private sector getting involved in terms of the transport and storage of foods. Um, 
And uh, last of all, there's also cooperation between countries. In school feeding, Brazil has been a, a big promoter of this. Uh, they have, um, starting with the Fomicero program, which some of you know about, no, under Lula, uh, they had a, they, they developed their school feeding program where they linked with local agriculture. Um, and so they've been doing a lot to um, have uh, uh, these uh, high level visits with governments to teach, to teach them about the Brazil experience and for them to also um, adapt, adapt it to their own country. And it's been very useful to get political buy-in, and then you can have um, more studies coming after that. But um, they've been really great at that. And also, you can't uh, forget about the host countries. I told you that uh, most school feeding is provided by governments themselves. And um, there's increased uh, capacity and political will of them, especially the ones that are going from low income to the middle income group. And um, they can also draw, uh, draw on their communities for support. But really, for these programs, for these countries, we've seen that agriculture is really, really key. Um, countries are really interested in doing it because of this specific objective. Um, they see school feeding not just as a cost, that, oh, they have to buy foods internationally so they can feed the children. No, they can actually source it locally, uh, creating jobs for farmers, creating jobs for the, the women who cook the foods, uh, for the people who transport the foods. And uh, it also looks very nice. You can take very nice pictures of kids having meals and um, governments from um, what we've even seen with, in countries where uh, there's been elections and the government has changed, they've wanted to keep the program, which is also very important. So um, basically, as a, someone like me, as a researcher, as an outsider to all this, there's a really, I think, a lot of opportunity to support, um, to support these governments to scale up their programs and to, um, to, to do it in an efficient and effective way. And oftentimes the questions that come is they want to know what works, um, how much does it cost, and how can we keep it going? So that's what I was doing through my work. And I'll tell you about basically that experience with Ghana. And Ghana, um, we had a funding from Dubai Cares, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, also the government of Ghana have also contributed a lot to this. Oh, I didn't know I was gonna do this. So the Ghana School Feeding Program was launched in uh, 2005. So it's one of these countries that started after. Um, and it was one of the pilot countries um, that was selected from NEPAD. And this program has three objectives. The first one is about education, increasing school enrollment, attendance and retention. The second one is about hunger and malnutrition, and the third one is about food protection. So this is what, this is um, the one they were most keen about um, adding here. And just to give you a sense of what, I gave you some statistics before, but here's a bit more. Uh, right now, enrollment is quite high in Ghana. It's one of the few countries that met the targets for the MDGs on, on this indicator. Uh, most children aren't, aren't in school, at least in primary school, but the performance is very poor. Ghana's at the bottom of the list for the TIMS education tests, uh, for math and literacy and so forth. So this, this is one of the challenges they're trying to address with school feeding. In terms of nutrition indicators, for this population, this primary school age children, 20% of them are stunted, 40% of them suffer from anemia. And in terms of agriculture, it's a huge part of the economy there. 40% uh, of the, the economy is subsistence, subsistence farming, and it's more than half of the workforce is, uh, is farming. And this map I have here, you can't really see it well, but each color represents an agroecological zone. Um, and this means whoa, like a different kind of climate, different kinds of crops are grown. Uh, it's a very diverse country in terms of um, what can be grown there's uh, more than 100 ethnic groups. The north is uh, much poorer than the south. There's just a lot of diversity. It's, it's a fascinating place. So this is also very interesting and important to take into account for that third objective about the, about the um, agriculture production. So I told you it started in 2005, and it's scaled up incredibly. Now it's uh, <coughs> providing meals for more than uh, one out of three school children over there. And it's managed by a national secretariat and is overseen by another ministry over there, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. 
So when I used to go to Ghana, we met, met a lot with, with these people. And just to provide you a little idea of how it works, uh, the caterers, who are the ones who, um, these are the really key people in the program, They're, they are tasked with uh, procuring the foods from the market and preparing them and giving them to children in school. So it's uh, usually they only hire women for this, and they can hire two or three cooks to support them depending on how big the school is. And they might service more than one school, de depends. Uh, depends how many they take up. Um, they're, they're basically business women. This is their job. And um, they get reimbursed based on this, on um, each, each meal. So each meal is 80 pesos, 80 cents over there for a meal. And um, what happens is that each district has a menu. So there's a different meal each day of the week, Monday through Friday. And based on the menu, they go out and buy the foods and then they prepare them. And it all sounds very nice, especially when you see the menus. So this is, on the left, I have one menu from a district. So you can see Monday, they have a corn, there's a green leaves, ayoyo soup. Um, they, they use fish a lot in this district. And, um, and it looks nice, there's a different meal each day. And, um, and this is in contrast to what you see from WFP. Um, I, just, I just find it incredible. So uh, WFP rations are like this, they're very basic. So it's rice, pulses, vegetable, oil, salt, and these micronutrient powders, just kind of cooked together like a porridge. And this is what's given to the kids every day. WP is still operating in the north of Ghana, but they're slowly handing over our schools to the government, who is trying to give these kind of meals. So, looks much better, I think. But there's a lot of challenges to this. Uh, uh, they, the, the guidelines for their program, they say, you know, provide these nutritious meals, use locally, local products, so forth. But there's no definition of what nutritious means. And uh, there's a million ways to produce uh, different meals, but uh, there's no guidelines how much oil to use, how much salt to use, uh, how many different, what kind of food groups you want to use, how to design the menu. It just simply says nutritious. Um, there's also simply no guide, there are no guidelines on where you procure foods. The idea is you procure locally, but um, foods can also travel distances. Um, they might be produced in some other country and then they're sold in the local market and then you buy there. But is that really, is that really supporting local agriculture? Um, they never made a decision. The government never decided what does locally mean and who do we want to procure from. Uh, there's also a lot of issues with what's available and what it costs, also seasonality. Remember I told you about the agroecological zone, so it also depends on where you are in Ghana, of course. Um, and then one of the really big issues is that this reimbursement scheme where the caterers just get a fixed uh, amount of money based on how many kids they feed, they have the incentive perhaps to, um, to uh, make small meals or use cheap ingredients over here. There's no standards on, on what they need to be preparing. So basically uh, we came in and uh, we were tasked to support the government to improve the program. They had a nice foundation in place, but the idea was to make it work and make it as effective and as efficient as possible. So we provided technical assistance to the government, and we also, around that intervention, we designed this impact evaluation. Uh, it's always very tricky. You don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Because to design the, to, to help make the program better, you want to draw an evidence on how to make it better, but many times the evidence was not available. So we were trying to, to make it better, but at the same time evaluate it. So it's a bit of a, a circular process here. So uh, basically our technical assistance, we, looked, we did a bunch of different interventions on different fronts, and I'm just going to tell you about the nutrition side today. There's also, uh, also interventions on the agriculture side. And uh, one of the key issues was um, on the meal design I mentioned to you. So what we did is we designed this tool called the School Meals Planner, um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. And once those, rash, those, those menus were planned, we then uh, developed these things called handy measures, which are basically calibrated um, uh, tools to actually serve the meals. So that would limit the issue where you might serve smaller meals than, than, uh, than, than they should be. Uh, we also designed a behavioral change campaign. So uh, we, the, we, had a, we hired a marketing company, developed these songs and also designed these posters, and it was surrounded about, uh, it was centered on uh, healthy eating behaviors. It was called the three Gs, <coughs> grow, glow, and 
I forget. Oh, go, glow, glow, and grow. I have some posters to show you about that. And um, the, rate, the, the, the messages were translated, I think it was in six languages, and they were played on the radio. Uh, in some areas of Ghana, radio wasn't used so much, so we used these uh, vans instead to uh, blast the messages in the communities. And last of all, we also tried micronutrient powders. Um, our strategy generally was to think that, you know, to, to get the children the nutrition they need through foods. But uh, we also tested out this intervention of micronutrient powders because there's a lot of interest in this from the nutrition community. And uh, so we, we, tried, we, we tested it out to understand uh, the cost of it, the process, uh, and maybe there's certain contexts where it makes sense to use. So we also tried this out. So for our impact evaluation, three arms. Uh, we had a control where there was no school feeding. We had one arm where there was just the regular Ghana school feeding program. And then the third one where we had these other interventions going on. So where we did that was concentrated in a certain set of schools. It wasn't the whole country. And we collected um, survey data at two points, one time in 2013 and another time in the following, uh, just last year. And it was quite interesting because we did all the data collection integrated with the government's own monitoring. So, um, in fact, um, th this added a lot of complications, but in a way it helps the sustainability of a program because once we're done with the impact evaluation, we have the systems in place to continue monitoring it afterwards and making the program better. <coughs> so this is just a quick overview of what we had. We, we focus on 58 districts in Ghana. There's 216 of them. And then we divided them up. What would be our treatment area? Is that my phone? That's your phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a boring slide too. Yeah, I'm just gonna let it go. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, just a basic uh, impact. I'm sure many of you have seen this kind of design. Nothing very interesting here. But the important thing is we had these two treatment arms, the regular school feeding and this other, other one. And then we collected all sorts of data. We had a questionnaire to the households. Uh, we had school questionnaires. We collected information on the school food environment. We measured the children. We got the hemoglobin measures. We did these cognition tests. And uh, the data itself is just uh, very rich. Um, as I mentioned before, there really isn't much information, especially on nutrition for the school-aged child. Um, so it's just um, it's incredibly rich. We're developing all sorts of papers that are just using this data that have nothing to do with the evaluation of the program, but just drawing on it. And the other thing is that um, we focus on these 59 districts, but they're located all over Ghana. There's 10 regions, and they're all over there. So we get we capture that as well. I'm going to skip this because we don't have so much time. And um, so this chart, you probably can't even read it. It's probably a bit small. But the idea is that basically with the intervention, the way we rolled it out is that we had to think about the different levels. We first started at the national level, then we went down to the district level, the school, and the community. At the national level, what was really important was setting recommendations for the school age, um, uh, school age child's nutrition. Um, there, there are no guidelines for what is considered nutritious, and there is no guideline for what, is, what children should have in terms of nutrition. Right there, and um, that's really. It. I think uh, we did a review in Africa, and um, not sure which country, but a few countries have guidelines. Brazil has guidelines. China has guidelines. Many other countries do, but in Africa it's quite limited. So that was really the first thing we did is agree on what are the guidelines, and so the government adopted the WHO guidelines for the school age child, and we also set a target that school meals should meet thirty percent of um, energy and micronutrient uh, recommendations for that age group. And we took the boys and girls have different dietary requirements, but we took the, the boys' requirements because it's a bit higher. And 30% is a bit arbitrary. Uh, it's what WFP uses. It's what um, WHO recommends, but it's a bit arbitrary. Um, but uh, that was a target. We had to agree with them. And from there, we defined um, this tool to design the actual menus. Because as I told you before, they define the meals. You saw the menu I showed you. So they mentioned different meals they have. It's usually a staple food and then some sort of soup or stew, which has vegetables or meat or whatever in it. But there's no, um, 
There's no information on how, what portions, uh, what's the, how much vegetables you use, how much rice you use. There's no measure on the quantity or how much each child should get. So we developed this tool to do precisely that. And then we had to, uh, we had to train the district officials how to use the tool. They developed the menus. They brought it to the school. And um, in the school, then we also did the behavioral change campaign. We developed these posters. These were put in the schools. We also had uh, some nutrition education, some uh, uh, hygiene training as well was also delivered. And this we did in conjunction with the government, with the school health and uh, school health, they're called chef. They have a coordinator for each district, so we work with them to uh, integrate the school meals, uh, the intervention with their work. And we also did some interventions in the community as well with this behavioral change, uh, distributing leaflets and um, some more outreach there. Oh, so I already told you about this. So, um, yep, so we got this target. This took, this took forever. This took a year, I think, just to get the government to agree on this. It sounds really basic, but it was not. Um, and it was just for a study, actually, but they've now adopted it for their whole program. So Ghana now has, um, has recommendations for the school-aged child. And this is what the planner looks like. It's an online tool. We have an offline version as well. And basically, the idea is that for each uh, dish they had, they would have to enter in the different foods that would go into the meal and set the, set the quantity. And based on that, um, these little gingerbread people up here would uh, fill up. <laughs> and um, we would also put the age group here, so it would be their recommendations for that 6 to 12, 12 age group. And then here you can see the meal, whatever they have now, is low in calcium. But if it's yellow or green, it's okay. So um, they would design the menus like this in a training. And then the menu would be defined, and that would be what they use for the school year. And uh, one other thing I should mention with this, it's it's a simple tool, um, but a lot of we had to get food composition tables because um, WFP's food composition tables were just corn, maize, very basic commodities. You didn't have all these other different vegetables and amazing things. You have in Ghana, so we had to work with the University of Ghana to develop a food composition table. And FAO also has a food composition table, but uh, it was quite small, I think. So we had to combine sources. I think uh, we had three or four different food composition tables to merge together for this. And this is a huge challenge. So if you're going to take this tool to another country, say somewhere in East Africa, we're now looking to put this into Nepal, they don't have food composition tables. We're going to have to go again and develop this. So there's a lot of work that goes into uh, this bit. Um, I should also mention that the nutritional content is based on raw foods. Of course, over the process of cooking and so forth, this can change. Um, it also doesn't take into account protein quality. There's many issues of, I mean, it's a very basic tool. Um, there's many ways we could build on it, but um, it, 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 would, it was quite useful and worked quite well, I would say, I would say in Ghana. So now this is what a menu looks like with the tool instead. So rather than listing the dish, which is what we had before, we just say like jollof rice, gari and beans, or whatever, we have the tool, we have the actual ingredients. Yeah? So rice, for example, Joel, rice, how would you define it? 100 grams of rice, 6 grams of oil, and this would be per child. Yeah? And then, um, so based on this information, then the caterer will know what to actually go by. And they do this by taking the quantity and they multiply it by the school enrollment. So you have the whole, the whole quantity you need per week. So that's what we trained them to do, is to multiply it out, and you would have the quantities, and then you would procure that way. And then to actually deliver, deliver the meals itself, or to measure for the cooking, we developed these things called handy measures, which are just everyday things they use in the market. You'll see a paint can, or a ladle, or whatever. So we went and took what they use in the market, we calibrated them, and mashed them to the menus to say, you know, you should be using this to measure out uh, rice for 32 children. This would be, this ladle would be what you do to serve um, food for each child. So they could, have, they cook in a big pot, you take a ladle and you scoop out for each child. So each child will get the same thing. And it's based on the, it's based on the, on the menu planner, on the quantities we, we recommended there. And then here's some pictures of the posters we did. Uh, I don't know if you can see them, but they're cute. They're nice. And um, the jingle, the radio songs we had are also based on these messages. 
And then just quickly some other work we've done with this, uh, with the data. Um, with a colleague, we did a, we looked at the menus and we analyzed the menus we got from the man, menu planner. And we looked at, you know, what's the quantity of cereals in there? What's the quantity of legumes? What is the demand we're creating? We're potentially creating for local farmers. Um, maybe we're not actually sourcing from them, but what is the potential? And so we did this study uh, looking at the quantities here. And um, we did it by North and South Ghana because they're, they're quite different. And no surprise, cereals was quite high. Cereals was quite high. Uh, but tubers are also quite high. Legumes, leafy green vegetables, not so much. And other vegetables, usually a lot of tomato and onion in here. And then uh, from the uh, impact, impact evaluation, where the analysis is still ongoing, it's, got, it's become quite a mess, actually. Uh, there's a lot of selection. Uh, children are getting older and they're not getting school meals. There's children dropping out of school. So they're sorting through all of this, but we're seeing quite interesting uh, educational impacts, uh, which, are, which is interesting. And in terms of nutrition, um, when we control for the, um, no, even just in the regular, but when we control it, it's even stronger for the selection. You're seeing these strong impacts on BMI for H for these children. And this is over, a three-year period. The intervention really came in after one year, so it's over a three-year period of seeing a strong impact. So, um, so we're still working on this. Uh, my colleague is developing a big economics paper looking at all the different uh, issues with this. Um, but it's really a very rich data, data set. Uh, we'll also be looking at the micronutrient powders because we also have the measurements on anemia, and we're hoping to look at the results for the kids who got the micronutrient powders versus the kids who didn't, and see if, if there's an impact there. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs>